growing up in the 1980s, there was nothing better than waking up early Saturday morning, pouring yourself a big bowl of cereal, and watching Saturday morning cartoons. Also in the 80s, there wasn't a more popular, well-known monster truck than Bigfoot himself. So why not combine the two? What could possibly go wrong? Yes, we're going to find out. I'm Bob, you're you, and this is Classically Bad Cinema. Saturday morning cartoons were a staple of American life for kids growing up in the 1980s. From Smurfs, Muppet Babies, Alvin and Chipmunks, to Dungeons and Dragons, there was nothing better. But one of the more obscure cartoons was Bigfoot and the Muscle Machine. This was a 1985 animated miniseries that aired on a half-hour TV series, Super Sunday and Super Saturday, which contained nine segments that ran for six minutes every weekend, along with robotics and humanoids, and the most successful series they had, Gem. The segments ended up being combined and turned into a 53-minute featured-length film. The series was animated by Toy Animation in Japan, but unlike its fellow segments of Gem and Inhumanoids, Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines didn't get picked up for a full-fledged television series. And as we start to dissect this video, you're going to see why. The action kicks off immediately as a woman is trying to escape some bikers. Now, one thing you're going to notice quickly is that the animation quality is a really mixed bag. In the intro, we get to see some pretty detailed animation, but as the movie goes and progresses, it loses a lot of that detail. The character movements also get clunky and wooden, and I'm not sure if animators just ran out of time or they just wanted to get this thing done. Anyways, the woman managed to evade capture from the bumbling bad guy that's led by Sly. Now, if you're a 1980s kid, and again, I mean a true 1980s kid, and you watch shows like G.I. Joe and Transformers, then you're going to recognize the voice of Christopher Collins, who voiced both Cobra Commander and Starscream in those original series. She escapes with a mysterious scroll, which we find out is a map. A map to what, you may ask? Well, we're going to have to wait a little later to learn that. Why do we have to wait, you also ask? Well, I think the revelation is so ridiculous, I don't think they're in any hurry to reveal it. The chase heads to a local stadium that's holding a monster truck rally. It's here where we get introduced to the heroes of the movie, which makes use of the commentator at the show to introduce us to the deep voice cowboy Yank Justice, who's the driver of Bigfoot, and like his truck is tough and strong, lean and me. There's also Orange Blossom that's driven by Professor D, Black Gold, who's driven by the twins Red and Redder, and the team will later be joined by Close McCall and his funny car Warlord. The movie did feature animated versions of actual vehicles that were popular at the time and completing under the United States Hot Rod Association banner, which obviously the big difference being that these weren't the actual people who operated these vehicles. This cartoon actually only existed for Hasbro to promote one of its toy lines, specifically their play school line of toy trucks based on the real life trucks that again were used in this cartoon. What are the odds? So in essence, what you're watching is an infomercial for toys. It's at this event where the mysterious woman meets up with Yank and his team who end up unwittingly helping her. Now, when I say she meets up with them, I mean she runs into the middle of the rally and almost gets run over by black gold. Missed it by that much. She then climbs to the summit of a pile of wrecked cars to hide from Sly and the gang. Of course, as it is in cartoons, there's no security or police or anyone for that matter that comes out to help her. But even the good guys seem to be on a coffee break. The goons steal a truck and start going up the pile of cars and everybody just looks over after hearing her scream. But lucky for her, Yank comes to her rescue. I'll bite, you know, taking his time, of course. Hey, the bad guy's got their time, he's got his. I mean, this is pretty ridiculous. Yank runs to his truck, drives over to the pile, climbs out, connects the hook to the back of the stolen truck, and finally pulls the truck off the pile before it can smash the car she's in. And all that time, she could have just opened up the door and ran away. But then if she did that, we wouldn't be subjected to a classic nail-biting cliche, now would we? He quickly takes care of two of the goons. The woman managed to escape, but not before putting the mysterious scroll under the front seat of Bigfoot. This little turn of events, as we're going to see, is going to cause our heroes plenty of trouble for the rest of the movie. After the debacle, that's the opening scene, we get introduced to the main villain of this thing. A guy so bad, we can't show his face. I mean, who is this guy? It's like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. Now, I'm not sure why they were so hell-bent on this. I mean, it's not like they're building some grand plot twist reveal or something. We also get to see his Ravens logo, so that way we know who keeps going after the hero throughout the movie. 
It also seems like he's utilizing the latest home theater technology that was developed by the fine people at Spaceball. That's true, sir. But there's been a new breakthrough in home video marketing. Instant cassettes. They're out in stores before the movie is finished. Sly is ordered to get the map and destroy the trucks. Why? I don't know. They have no idea that there's a map hidden in Bigfoot. Why not just wait until the truck's by itself and break in and steal it? Hell, steal the radio and they'll think that's what you are after. But instead, they utilize some of the most over-the-top, outrageous schemes and attacks to get the map back. Some of which, I swear, would result in the map getting destroyed in the process. The first attempt involved the use of explosives, causing our hero to swerve for their lives. Avalanche! Avalanche. Seems more like a terrorist attack. There is a lot of odd dialogue in this movie. I swear I'd use a four-letter word, but it wouldn't be that. And these over-the-top attacks just keep coming. This time, we got motorcycle riders who look like some pretty bad dudes. And, of course, when I say bad, I mean ridiculous looking. I just got to say, I'm really curious at the outfits that these guys decided not to wear because these were more appropriate for the occasion at hand. What's that supposed to mean? And also medieval weapons, really. Is that a spear with another point? I mean, are you guys even trying? There's that Raven logo. Glad this dude's trying to keep a low profile. I also love the lack of continuity. At the rally, Yank hit two guys with helmets and sent them flying like 40 feet. Here he punches one guy and he hurts his hand. But then he hits another guy and sends him flying off the truck. The team takes some time to fix their truck after surviving the heroin events and attempted murder. Probably should call the police, but who has time for that? The mysterious woman sneaks into the garage and fails to retrieve the map from Bigfoot due to another attack. This time with a wrecking ball that conveniently destroys the building around them. How convenient! Yank jumps into action, destroys the wrecking ball, and the team finally notices the Raven's Cross logo. Curious? That was the symbol the bikers wore. Might have been more useful if they would have noticed that large ass logo on the side of the building when they first arrived. After discovering this detail and trying to work on their vehicles in the garage with the same logo on it, our heroes decide to do the logical thing and hire the owner of the garage, A.K. Sly, to be a mechanic. After finding out that they were headed to Vegas, he tells him he knows a good route. Wow, this is the route. To the desert! I'm just going to say it now. If you end up in a murder barn or a bathtub full of ice mist and a kidney, you only got yourself to blame, my friend. Now, it doesn't take long for Sly to initiate his plan to retrieve the map and a tank yank with a can of soda. Why? I don't know. Why not just wait until he stops for gas or something and grab the map and run? This plan, of course, spectacularly fails and we get more of that award-winning dialogue. Where are you going? I got a soda pop for you! Oh, and one of my favorite lines in this whole thing. This is getting mighty peculiar. Really? You've been attacked four times now with explosives, axe, sword-yielding maniacs, a wrecking ball, and now almost run over in the desert and you're just noticing something peculiar? That's what turns me on about you. Your attention to detail. They finally make it to Vegas after all these peculiar turn of events and Yank is pissed to find out that Bigfoot did not get top billing. After all the attempts on their lives at this point, this is what he's pissed about. Really? This is what you're pissed about? Not getting top billing? Can we get anybody else to run this team? Any, anybody, anybody. Yank wants a one-on-one -on -one with Grave Roller, which he is granted. Which we find out is just another elaborate ruse to get the map. They could have had just someone just break into the truck while he was bitching at the promoter, since they still don't know that it's there. Yank and Bigfoot go title for title with Grave Roller over a pit of water. One of the mysterious bad guys goon stumps acid into the pit and throws a jug in there as well, dissolving it. Just in case you were just wondering how deadly this pit was now. Alright, time to go to the nitpick zone. Now, just out of curiosity, if the acid can dissolve the jug, then how did the dude carry it to the pit? Would the jug have dissolved the second he dumped that acid into it? And wouldn't also the map be destroyed along with Yank and Bigfoot if they fell in? Not a great plan. This move ends up kicking him in the ass anyways, as the chain holding the two trucks snaps from the acid. Seems if they would have left out the acid, Bigfoot might have lost, and they would have the truck and the map. With the chain snapped, these two hooligans go on a destructive chase through the Vegas Strip, smashing through multiple casinos, putting hundreds of lives in danger. Yank does manage to catch Slide, and what does he do after he catches him? Call the police? Perhaps kick some wholesale ass? Nope. He simply tells them, I don't want to see you again. 
Yeah, why not just send him an angry letter telling him you're angry? But Yank doesn't have much time to deal with Sly anyways, as Jennifer, the mysterious woman, attempts to steal Bigfoot. Ah, the monster truck doesn't seem a vehicle that you can just simply jump in and take off without having really the experience driving it. Yank and his team learn a couple of things here. First, that there's a map hidden in the truck that the goons have been trying to steal, explaining all the your happenings that's been going on. And we also learned that Jennifer's kind of a bitch. What do you want with this? I am not obliged to tell you anything. Seriously, this woman hides a map in his truck, puts all their lives in mortal danger numerous times, and has the audacity to give him crap? Oh, hell no. The gang tells her with everything that's happened that they consider themselves to be half owners of the map. I'll be honest, I just burned the damn thing myself at this point and leave her on the strip mourning the ashes. Dr. Claus, of course, still after the map and continuity, unfortunately, takes a big backseat here. I mean, big time. It won't happen again, sir. Now, I'm not sure what this nonsense is, but not only is that not the voice of Christopher Collin, Stop her! But that's not even remotely close to sounding like As the team continues to travel Indiana Jones style, Karen continues to be difficult. Lucky for us, we get to find out what truly is important to Yang. I like Bigfoot, my team, and freedom, and that about covers it. Seems like a pretty reasonable list to me. They, of course, are attacked again, and we get some more odd dialogue. She's got a crush on him! Also, what happened to the third and fourth combine? Here, one shot, gone the next, return the following. And not to mention, I love how the bad guys continue to give Yank time to counter their attacks. Are we missing some animation here? How does he hook on the one combine and destroy it in this shot? And in the next, we have four combines destroyed. We also get introduced to Close McCall and Warlord, who conveniently shows up after the attack. After surviving more events, the police finally get involved. Unfortunately, the authorities are under direction of Sly, and Jennifer is forced to translate the map. Luckily, Warlord shows up for a good old-fashioned prison break. And even more lucky for them, the jail seems to be made of cardboard and not actually occupied by any police officers. They manage to escape the cardboard jail and go on a police chase and are forced to jump a raised bridge, which everyone makes but Bigfoot who plunges into the river below. Not quite. Bigfoot pops out of the water. Now this may seem far-fetched, but Bigfoot could actually float, and this was a clever way to utilize one of the truck's actual abilities in this cartoon. Slide and the gang comedy a riverboat and conveniently happens to be at this exact area at this exact time and go after Yank and Jennifer. They force him to the bottom of the river into a potentially watery grave. But Bigfoot doesn't have any time for that nonsense, and they engage torpedo mode and shoot out of the water onto the shore. Because vehicles in the 1980s could do that. Sly takes Raven across the location Jennifer gave him just to find out that she absolutely lied to him. It's because you're a dumbass. <laughs> and just led him to a fountain in the middle of anywhere USA. Although I have to say the actual location isn't any less ridiculous than this. And also say goodbye to Sly because you're never going to see him in this cartoon again. The movie finally reveals the mysterious Dr. Claw wannabe to be recluse billionaire Adrian Ravenscross. But that's all we get before yet another attack. How the hell does this guy keep finding them so easily? They end up getting attacked with flaming arrows and not some sort of high-tech weapons. You know, for a billionaire, this guy is really, really cheap. You cheap bastard! Bigfoot gets forced to fight Barbarian and get pushed into a pit of spite. Now, I was already asking how he keeps finding him so easily, but I think the bigger question I have now is how the hell did he know to put a pit of spikes at this exact location? Yank and his chauffeur get into a fight as Jennifer sneaks into Barbarian and sends a truck careening into the swamp. After narrowly escaping yet another attack, this time involving steamrollers and cement trucks, the team ends up at a junkyard where they towed Bigfoot. And we finally get to find out what this is a map to. It's the Fountain of Youth. What? The Fountain of Youth. Hey, I tried to warn you how completely ridiculous this plot is and probably the reason why they waited so long to reveal it, because it's f***ing stupid. We get treated to narration by Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon in his last expedition. Anyways, long story short, we find out they found the Fountain of Youth, the old were made young, the weak were made strong. We end up getting a second narrator that informs us that they were ambushed and everyone but the narrator was killed. Fortunately for us, the new narrator is killed moments later and had just enough time to record his own death. Did he actually record his own groan on paper as he died? Because if he did, it was nice that the people killing him allowed him time to do that. 
That's all we get is barbarian attacks again, almost kills our heroes again. For some odd reason, Red and Red are are sitting in their truck doing nothing, need Bigfoot to save them instead of just driving out of the way of barbarian. Professor D is almost crushed but is saved at the last second. Bigfoot finally manages to defeat Barbarian. It's gonna blow! Oh, the movie's not that bad, Yank. Come on. Jennifer ends up getting kidnapped by Raven's Cross, and we finally get the big reveal of his identity. And wow, this is it. This is what all the buildup was for. What an absolute Star Wars Phantom Menace letdown this was. But on a more positive note, Raven's Cross was voiced by legendary voice actor Peter Cohen who famously did Optimus Prime in the original Transformer animated series, reprising the role many times in 2007. He also did the voice of Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh franchise, Monterey Jack in Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers, and was the voice of Carr in the original TV show Knight Rider. Anyways, back to the action. If you're telling yourself, I need some more over-the-top action scenes, well, you've come to the right place, my friend. Because we have a very, very over-the-top chase scene. Full of missiles, tanks, a limo that can transform into a monster truck, a ramp, and has remote-controlled missiles itself. Jennifer manages to escape, and the team chases after Raven's Cross. The only problem is that the entire area around the fountain is booby-trapped, and of course he has a map and the location of the only safe entrance to the fountain. Now, this, of course, would make a hell of a lot more sense if they weren't trailing this guy by like 10 yards and didn't just have the ability to follow the same path through the area as him. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, they don't. And one by one, each vehicle is destroyed, leaving only Bigfoot left. The bad guy reaches the fountain first and drinks from it and becomes young again and goes after Bigfoot. Instead of fighting Raven's Cross, Yank puts Bigfoot into bitch mode and smashes the fountain. Which leads to my favorite line in this entire movie. Die, Justice. Yank nearly escapes from being rammed by Raven's Cross as he hits the fountain instead. Raven's Cross makes one final attempt to take out our heroes, but unfortunately triggers a booby trap himself and his limo is destroyed, sending Raven Cross running into the swamp, revowing revenge, but reverting to an old man as alligators approach. Sucks to be that guy. Things seem pretty bleak as the team realize all their vehicles are destroyed and they can't afford to fix them. But luckily for them, an earthquake creates a crevice that Close McCall falls into, revealing a buried treasure. During the celebration, Yank and Jennifer take Bigfoot into the sunset, leaving the rest of the team helpless in an alligator-infested Florida swamp. The end. So what did I think of this 1980s animated classic? Well, it's time to go to the hits and misses and find out. And starting with the misses, which is the animation itself. As stated before, the animation is a real mixed bag. The intro is pretty detailed, but after that, the quality really takes a nosedive. I mean, just look at the font script on Bigfoot. It looks like it was written with a Sharpie. Yet in the intro, it's really detailed, as well as some other examples. Makes you wonder that after completing the intro, it was animated by people rejected by that study-at-home art school that was advertised on TV at the time. As if the idea of looking for the Fountain of Youth wasn't silly enough, the scheming and length the bad guy go to get the map is just really ridiculous. You'd think they just wait for an opting time just to break into the truck and take the damn thing. I mean, because remember, at one point, no one knew that there was a map even in the truck. Instead, we get one complicated, over-the-top scheme after another. The dialogue is something else entirely. We get some pretty strange and often odd dialogue in the weirdest time. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. And may God have mercy on your soul. Which again just makes you think that the characters are oblivious to the danger they're in. Then of course the big reveals, or the lack thereof. I mean, the movie does a lot to hide Raven's cross identity from showing his hand like Dr. Claw to shadowing him out. All this didn't lead to some earth-shattering reveal. It wouldn't have mattered if we would have seen him from the beginning or not. Then there's the map that we have to wait till the movie's like three quarters of the way over before we found exactly what it's a map to. Now, I'm not sure what is more ridiculous, that it's the Fountain of Youth, or the fact that the Fountain of Youth is really located in a pretty open area and needed a map in order to be discovered at all. I'm shocked that someone didn't just accidentally stumble upon it by mistake. But of course, the hits. And the big one here is obviously, besides Saturday morning cartoons, is Bigfoot. As I said, as a kid growing up in the 80s, I loved cartoons and loved Bigfoot. And honestly, 
I could have cared less how silly this plot was of this cartoon with all its plot holes. Bigfoot was the original monster truck and a household name at this time. Whether people were a fan of the big blue monster truck that crushed cars beneath its massive tires or not. It also included other famous vehicles you would probably would have recognized. As poor as the animation could be, thankfully it makes up for it with plenty insane over the top action. And it never relents. Yes, it's a bit dumb, ridiculous most of the time, but it's fun and entertaining. Creating just good, simple, straightforward, action-packed, animated adventure. It's got a diverse cast of stereotypical characters voiced by some of the most famous voice actors from the 1980s and beyond that would have been easily recognizable to kids at the time. So it's one of those classic examples of it's so bad, it's good. So is this movie worth your time or should you create some sort of elaborate scheme to destroy it? I say it's worth your time. If you're an 80s cartoon fan or looking for some nostalgic movie to watch, I mean, the plot is ridiculous, the dialogue is odd, and the animation is okay at best. All of which explains why it wasn't picked up for a series like Jammer and Humanoids. But it all culminates into a cartoon that I just can't hate. Even if it's a cartoon that's just an excuse to sell toys and goes on repeatedly for 53 minutes. Hey, it's the end of the video. Is it? I mean, it's over? It's finally over? Yeah, go home. We can all go home now? Well, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like and subscribe button below. If you didn't enjoy it, then tell that Karen that's put your friends and you in danger repeatedly throughout the whole thing to hit that like and subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Bob, you're you. So long, everybody.